Hi there, and welcome to The Health Reporter, helping you live a longer, stronger, and happier life. I'm Karen Owak. And I'm John Kessler. And coming up on The Health Reporter today, it's kind of an age-related show. We're going to take a look at testosterone replacement therapy. What are the pluses? What are the dangers? And will it help you be the man you used to be? Also, prostate cancer. Who's most likely to get it? Yes, men, but we'll get more specific. And what can be done if you have it? As well as what foods may actually increase your risk of prostate cancer? Also, we'll take a look at something that actually got its start as a tool to help doctors work on the prostate. And now it's used for all sorts of things. And the doctor doesn't even have to be there. Well, you've probably seen the commercials. Suffering from low T, low energy, a depressed mood, a low sex drive. Could be low T. And then they throw a little pitch in there for a testosterone booster. So what causes low T? What can you do? Is replacing testosterone a good thing? What are the risks, the side effects? Well, for answers, we turn to our experts, Dr. Mark Lawler and Dr. Neil Okamura. Dr. Okamura is a board certified in internal medicine with the San Ramon Regional and John Muir Medical Centers. He specializes in manual medicine with an emphasis on internal organ health and disease prevention. Dr. Okamura is also the former chief of staff at the San Ramon Regional Medical Center. Dr. Mark Lawler is a board certified specialist in obstetrics and gynecology and has delivered more than six thousand babies, including mine. He's also with the San Ramon Regional and John Muir Medical Centers and was one of the chief surgeons that performed robotic surgery in the San Francisco Bay Area. Dr. Lawler was recently recognized by U.S. News as one of our nation's top doctors. Doctors, thank you very mm -hmm. much for being thank there. Testosterone. You. Give us a little quick. What is it? What does it do? Do we need to control it? Who wants to jump at it? Go ahead, Mark. Testosterone is a hormone. Uh, actually, this is going to be primarily Neil's topic. Uh, there's been recent recognition about this, the changes in testosterone as men age. Is there a male equivalent of the menopause? As an OBGYN, I deal with menopause all the time, which is an abrupt change in, in a hormonal environment in women sometime around ages 50 to 52. The question has been, do males experience something similar? And in fact, it turns out they do. Uh, menopause? Typ menopause. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, a man can, uh, can lose about 1% of their, of their testosterone levels every year after about, a, I think, age 40 or 50, uh, with some pretty, um, pretty serious consequences. And Neil knows a whole lot about that. So what are those consequences? Well, you know, the, the comparison of menopause and menopause, uh -huh. it's, it's kind of not totally a, a, a comparable well, comparison on that basis because when you look at menopause, women actually lose the ability to produce estrogen from their ovaries. Men, however, never lose the ability to produce testosterone. So it's a catchy term, but I, it's not a phrase that is really that accurate. accurate. So the things that are selling on television, though, if you got low energy, low sex drive, just take a little pill and it's going to work, that's not necessarily case. Not necessarily safe either. Aren't there some complications, too, for yes. testosterone replacement? And what a doctor would do, testosterone replacement-wise, is a lot different than a pill you can buy over the counter, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to look at as far as the cause of low T. The workup should, you know, bare minimum, you should look at the t not just the total testosterone level. Uh, a lot of people try to look at the free testosterone level, the um, luteinizing hormone, which is the, um, it, it actually is what stimulates the te uh, testicles to produce testosterone. So, and then there's other things that you want to rule out as possible other causes of low T. It's not just as simple as, oh, low T, give you a testosterone and, and off you go. So there so, are some. So let's take John, for example. Ah. <laughs> so, <laughs> feeling Where? feeling uh, low energy, kind of moody. Don't even go, <laughs> don't even go to the uh, Maybe, get, maybe that going, that getting a little, uh, gaining a little weight and maybe uh, preferring a sandwich over sex. So how would you Depends know, sandwich. yeah, how would we know <laughs> whether it's, it's age related or something else? I mean, at what point should he go see the doctor and get tested? Well, and that's real important. As far as energy level, like Mark said, is, is when you, uh, around 50 years of age, the low T is somewhere between 40 and 60%. So it's very significant compared to 
hypothyroidism, which is much less in that age group and in males. So if your symptoms progressively cause you without change of low energy, low sex drive, central weight gain, and the older you get, the symptoms actually change. Uh, for younger males, we think of the, the libido, the sex drive. But in older males, you're looking at central obesity. The fatigue is common in both sides. Um, but there's other subtleties, such as um, blood tests that show a mild anemia. And these are in elderly patients that come in with, oh, I'm tired. I'm, you know, no energy. I can't get myself out of a chair. Uh, screening for low T is important in that in that population, as well as the 50-year-old who just doesn't have the sex drive, or even younger. Mm -hmm. What are, are, th are there drawbacks? I mean, simply replacing testosterone in the body. Uh, there, it sounds like a is, great thing, right? Or is the right? drawback through the delivery method? I mean, I've, I've heard that there's some concern about uh, getting into, is it the kidneys? Uh, well, no, so the, the, the... Or the liver. The liver. I'm going to go through orally. every organ. Okay, yeah. that's good. <laughs> taking it orally <laughs> on some long. They had long-acting pills to deliver testosterone, but yeah. they found that there was an increased risk of liver toxicity or liver damage. So the newer techniques used are typically topical. They've started with patches. They had a uh, uh, now gels, and there's several on the market. Um, but even before that was injections and the injections of uh, testosterone tend to have more side effects because it's less physiologic. You're getting super right. boosting yeah. doses that um, don't quite follow physiologic patterns, uh, whereas the daily applications of gels, you're actually maintaining it more where physiologic uh, testosterone should be and you get a smoother, less side effect. Um, what are those side effects? One of those that can be even life-threatening, is your hemoglobin hematocrit could rise significantly. And if it's not followed or tracked, some people get in trouble and can lead to strokes or heart attacks. Another thing is your prostate. Well, your prostate is fully saturated by testosterone almost at any blood level. So you should not see an increase in PSA, uh, prostate-specific antigen, by adding testosterone. So that is something that we monitor and look for. Testosterone doesn't cause cancer. That was a common belief that it caused cancer. However, if you do have cancer, it can accelerate the growth. Um, so there's a lot of controversy on people who've had prostate cancer and their prostate removed, whether or not they should ever be exposed to testosterone. Which is what we're going to be talking and about in the... The prostate. The, yeah. But one, one quick question. Are the things we see advertised on television, do they work? Ah. Um, absolutely. I mean, for every okay. patient that, that <clears throat> gets a Viagra or the pill for uh, erectile dysfunction should be assessed and evaluated for low T because hypogonadism is very common in that age group. So, Mark, uh, using the topicals, if a man is using the topicals, what happens if a woman rubs up against that. So it's, it's, interesting that you, um, <laughs> it's interesting that you mention that because of all of the, the, the things studied with female sex drive, uh, the only compound that we're aware of that, that creates sex drive in females is testosterone. So a woman's uh -huh. sex drive is also testosterone dependent. And so a lot of people do supplement testosterone for women. They use the gel. They use one-tenth of the... It's the same thing? It's the, the same, same exact product. It, you'll use approximately one-tenth the dose that a man would use, which makes it a lot less expensive to use. There are some risks. If you're very sensitive tes to testos testosterone, you can get permanent changes in your voice. You can get hair growth. Permanent? Permanent. So you have to be careful. But as a last resort... It's, it's used, it's off-label, it's not FDA approved for that use, but it's certainly widely used. Interesting. And not just women, children, especially children, oh, have to be really careful. That's right, so you don't want to be hugging be your, your so the, kids yeah. while you're the supplementing. The applications yes. of testosterone uh, on the topical delivery um, have been looking at it. The, the original ones came out, well, the first one was a patch, but a lot of people had difficulty with rashes. Um, with the patch. Or, and the other is um, the topical gels that you rub on your shoulders and arms. Mm -hmm. But 
being with a loved one or carrying an infant oh, led yeah. to problems, and that is a true risk in, in terms right. of... Um, well, we could talk about this forever, huh? We have been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, our second topic is the second most common cancer in the United States and the second leading cause of cancer-related death in men. It's prostate cancer. The National Cancer Institute predicts there will be 233,000 new cases of prostate cancer this year in the U.S., and nearly 30,000 people will die because of it. Give us a little idea of what the, I mean, for most men, they know the rubber glove and they take the, <laughs> take the position. And, what are they looking for? Uh. <laughs> and well, John, it seems like a really you. odd way <laughs> <laughs> to find cancer. You've done but, many of these. Yes. I mean, you probably so, had many. I guess you can, you can feel, you, you feel for the prostate, right? Absolutely, and, absolutely. That, there's, I mean, two main ways that uh, physicians follow on a, prostate exam and uh, you know very important to check digitally what you actually enter through the rectum um, you're actually feeling a prostate that say comparatively is about the size of the well not size of fist but a walnut size but it only about a third of it is sticking into the rectum so you're actually trying to assess the size the the texture the nodularity of the prostate just feeling about a third of that prostate it's not a perfect test, but when you pick up a nodule, it's very significant, needs to be further evaluated, ultrasound, biopsies possibly. Uh, the other way of monitoring or, or trying to pick up prostate disease is the PSA, the prostate specific antigen, and that is a blood test. It's not a great screening tool. It wasn't designed for a screening tool. It was more designed as following patients who have prostate disease, who have had it removed, and then you follow them annually or, or more frequent than that to see if the PSA is rising. Um, but we still look at the, the PSA, and now physicians, urology primarily is looking at the um, kind of the velocity of the rise in the PSA. And the velocity kind of gives you more information, um, and, and the free, test, uh, free PSA also gives you information. It's, it's odd that the less free PSA in the blood is actually correlated with higher risk of prostate cancer. So, so Mark, you're, you're, you specialize in robotic surgery. Tell us about prostate cancer and, well, and the robot. When the, uh, when the technology was first developed <clears throat> to do robotic surgery, uh, it in, instantly found a home in prostatic surgery for a few reasons. It's delicate surgery. The nerves to the prostate are very important if a man wants to retain sexual function. And the prostate's in a terribly difficult place to access. It's in a little cup in the bottom of the pelvis. It's hard to get to. What robotic surgery did was miniaturized instruments and allowed them access to this little tiny area where you can magnify the field of view, use tiny little instruments, and do delicate, delicate surgery in a tiny little place. And it turned out to just work beautifully. Uh, OBGYN we're operating in exactly the same part of the body. It's in, a, it's in a narrow little hole in the bottom of the pelvis. And what we've done now is hysterectomies are now be, being performed with the robot and the dis difference in recovery for the patients is just dramatic. Uh, hysterectomy is the most common operation performed on women other than cesarean sections. Uh, typically three days in the hospital and six week recovery time with a traditional big incision. Robotics uh, have reduced that. We now send our patients home the same day, all of them, uh, after robotic surgery, virtually all of them, and back to work within a week or so. That's amazing. When, uh, might as well go right on to robotics yeah. if we're going to talk about it anyway. Right. That started, what, in late 70s? When did that well, the, start? Well, the, the prototypes were late 70s. The hospital in San Ramon actually, I think, had the second uh, Da Vinci robot sold uh, in the United States, and that was 22 years ago. And you were the pioneer. Well, one of the early adopters in GYN, but the people who paved the way for us were, were uh, urologists doing prostatic surgery. And they're still doing, uh, still doing advances on, on, on this, correct? And they're Absolutely. Also, and now they're tying, they were thinking in the battlefield, 
you know, the U.S. government looked at it and said, you know, this might work very well. Has it actually been adopted to that? Uh, no, no one talks about that, but we certainly know that you can do remote surgery yeah. with the technology. That's the easiest part of it. So the, it, with robotic surgery, the surgeon's at a console, the patient's on the other side of the room, and there's no problem at all in adapting that technology to being farther and farther Miles away, away, should you need to be. Um, they even have uh, training modules where you can have a surgeon in Europe, for example, uh, who might be one of the world's experts looking in on your surgery and helping you when you're here in the United States. Well, I had the pleasure of visiting with our own Dr. Lawler earlier, and he gave me an overview of robotic surgery and how he uses it in his surgical practice. Take a look. So the Da Vinci robot is an instrument built by a team of engineers that allows a, a surgeon to operate using a, a pure three-dimensional image, using miniaturized instruments to operate on a patient, uh, either in the same room or, or absolutely could be anywhere, uh, using very tiny incisions. And what this allows for is, in a way never before achievable, is very small incisions, very tiny instruments, which means a more delicate, a more precise surgery, less blood loss, much quicker recovery time. The Da Vinci robot was primarily used by urologists in the beginning, then it was adopted by, for GYN surgery. They're now doing thoracic surgery, cardiac surgery. Uh, in the future, I think that very few areas of surgery will not be done with a technique like this. And now, uh, the most rapidly growing segment of robotic surgery is gynecologic surgery. Because gynecologic surgeries have typically meant a very big incision and a very long recovery. And it turns out the vast majority of those are completely unnecessary and we can get the patients out of the hospital in a few hours rather than a few days. And it makes a dramatic difference to people's lives. And unfortunately, most hysterectomies in this uh, country are still done in the traditional open fashion. It's a very big incision. We put retractors in the abdomen that pull the tissue and stretch it uh, to keep the incision open. Uh, all of the organs get exposed to a lot of air and, and, uh, and a lot of stretching and pulling. Uh, it's a good operation and it's a safe operation, but it's, ex it's characterized by much longer recovery time, three or four days in the hospital, much more blood loss, uh, and the patient can expect to be out of work about six weeks. And, and as I said, most operations are still done that way. We advanced several years ago to minimally invasive surgery where we're using a laparoscope. And a laparoscope is a brilliant invention where a camera is inserted through a tiny incision in the belly and other small little ports, about as big around as a pen, through which we can insert long slender instruments with operating instruments at the, at the tips of these instruments. And anything that you can use in traditional surgery can be miniaturized and used on a laparoscopic instrument. You can have scissors and coagulators and graspers and all of those things. So that, that was the next step. But the, the limitation with laparoscopic surgery is you have a rigid instrument. It's, it's long and straight and it doesn't move very well. So it's, it opens and closes, but it, it's not terribly mobile. What the robotic instrument does is allows those laparoscopic instruments to be attached to a, to a robot that's electronically controlled uh, and it moves like your wrist. When you're doing robotic surgery as opposed to laparoscopic surgery, because you have a three-dimensional view of, of the surgical field, it very much feels like you're operating with your hands instead of surgical instruments. They have a full range of motion and you can do things through the robot that you really cannot even attempt through laparoscopy because of the dexterity of the surgical equipment. So when you're doing a laparoscopic surgery, you're looking at a monitor just like the TV in your home, a flat screen monitor, which is two dimensional. So you get a good picture and you get high definition, but it's two dimensional and you can't judge depth. It's completely different with the robot. When you put your head into the console, the robot has actually two cameras instead of one, so it gives you a true three dimensional image. So when you're operating with the Da Vinci, the only thing you see, you don't see the room or the people around you, all you see is the inside of the patient that you're operating on. And visually it feels very much like you shrunk yourself and you're inside the patient's abdomen. And when you're using the surgical instruments, it almost feels as if they're your own hands. It feels like you're inside the patient's body and using the surgical instruments as if they're your own hands. It's an entirely different type of surgery. And it gives surgeons confidence that they can do far more delicate and, and, and precise movements with the robot than you can do with any other technique surgically.
takes a little bit of getting used to, but they have a terrific program at, at the headquarters where they train you, including simulators where you're not actually operating on people, uh, that judge a surgeon's dexterity and how close he's getting to, the, to that critical point where he's able to operate on people with safety and, and confidence. Most, most cancer cases are still done with a big, big open procedure. You're limited uh, to your focal length of your eyes. With the Da Vinci robot, you have complete control of what you look at. You can zoom the camera in, you can magnify whatever you want to look at, you can make it uh, look farther away, look smaller. You can translate the motion of your hand so it enables you to have far greater fine motor control than you would with just an instrument in your, in your bare hands. So how that translates into cancer surgery is a much more precise type of surgery. So it's a better operation for the surgeon who wants to get rid of, of the cancer or the scar tissue or anything else you're treating. And it's a tremendous advance for the patient because she's gonna get a minimally invasive procedure with a tremendous, tremendously quick recovery associated with that. If you talk to most of the, the uh, GYN oncologists, and there are several in the area who are using the robot uh, very heavily for treating cancer, they have tremendous confidence that in five or 10 years from now, when we've collected all the data, that they're gonna have very, very good results with using robotic surgery to treat cancer. My understanding is that there have been surgeries performed in Europe with a surgeon in Los Angeles. Uh, of course, you'd need a, another physician at the patient's side in case something were to go wrong, which we always have, um, but certainly it's technically possible. I think that the military is looking at robotic surgery, the possibility of doing battlefield surgery with a surgeon located in a remote, in a, in a remote area is certainly possible, it hasn't been done, but I'm, I'm absolutely certain they're thinking in that, in that direction. When I started my practice 20 years ago, all of the hysterectomies that we did were the old-fashioned uh, big abdominal incisions. And our patients used a lot of pain medication and they tended to be in the hospital about four days. Uh, they had the complications with fever and infection we had, were things that we dealt with all the time. Robotic surgery and minimally invasive surgery have completely changed what we expect from surgery. When I do a minimally invasive hysterectomy, a lot of my patients uh, will use no narcotic pain medication after surgery. Uh, frequently they'll use nothing but Motrin or Ibuprofen after surgery and that is a dramatic change from where we were before. I've had patients go back to the gym three days after a hysterectomy. Twenty years ago that would have been impossible. Uh, today it's not even surprising when that happens. So for me it makes my job interesting and it makes it fun and it's, it's technology and it's, it's spectacularly wonderful to work with and the great part of it is seeing your patients get up out of the hospital bed and go back to work and get on with their lives. Uh, reduce complication rates, less bleeding, less infection. It's just been a, uh, a wonderful revolution in surgery. I think the most important thing to, th to think about when we're, you're considering a robotic surgery is that the surgeon has the best view, best field of view of the, of the operative field of any surgical approach. He can see better, he can see more, and he has the dexterity with his surgical instruments to do things that are impossible through any other surgical approach. So if you have a difficult surgery or a complicated surgery, this is a way for the surgeon to do a much more precise, delicate operation and for the patient to have a very, very quick recovery and expect less blood loss and fewer complications. I think once a hospital buys a robot, which is an expensive piece of equipment, uh, then having the patient stay a few hours in the hospital rather than several days is actually saving everybody money. Uh, the patient's not going to be out of work for very long, so the disability insurance companies are quite happy with that. The medical insurance companies are happy with the shorter length of stay. And of course, the patients and the doctors are happy as well. So I think everybody wins when you have a da Vinci surgery. This is a part of the show where we get to see what's on your mind. Our What's Up Doc question comes from Michelle in Danville, California, who wants to know, I had a DEXA scan recently and was diagnosed with osteopenia. I was told my average bone mineral density is below the mean value for a young adult. What does that mean and is there a cure? Let's ask the doctors. Yes. I've been yes. called dance before. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think they were talking yes. about my bones. Especially you, Mark, because you deal with this. With, deal with, with this every day. Yeah. So 
Osteopenia means that your bones are less dense than we would expect for someone your age. Uh, taking one value and one x-ray of your bone and saying that you're osteopenic is nothing to panic about. It's usually an indication that if you repeat the test in a year and if you're showing rapid decline, then you're probably a candidate for treatment. It's a serious problem because worldwide there are about 10 million fractures a year that are due to osteoporosis. So osteopenia is the early stage of bone loss that if it accelerates could lead to osteoporosis, which is a tremendous healthcare concern, particularly in, in elderly people. Uh, I think everyone should be evaluated for their risks. The risks are age-related, race and ethnicity, and as well as if you've had a history of any other previous fractures. What is the, the, the baseline you look at, though? Is, is there a, like a certain age person that has a certain bone density, and that's our baseline? Sure. It's, work, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great big bell-shaped curve, and, and they put your age and your bone density after you've had the special x-ray on that curve to find out where you are. Uh -huh. And if you fall... For osteopenia, they call it one standard deviation outside of the normal. And that's, the normal is about 68%. So if you fall on either side of that, you either have too much or too little. So that puts you in that low zone. But until you take that second test, you don't, it could be I just okay. have... You may not know. You I, may, it just may be I have yes. low density bones, right? Or, or, it precisely. Yeah. So for example, what I'll, I'll have is I'll have a young woman who's near the age of menopause, whose mother had osteoporosis and, and, and a history of fractures who wants to have a, be a, have a bone scan. So we'll order a DEXA scan. It'll typically show some osteopenia. And then we'll talk about, well, let's wait a year and see if there's a rapid rate of bone loss. If we see an appreciable rate of bone loss the next year, then it's time to start talking about the therapies that are available. Like? The, well, the first things are simple that everyone can do. The, the way to a healthy bone is plenty of calcium, vitamin D, and weight-bearing exercise. Interestingly, people you know, shriek a little bit when you talk about exercise. Walking is just as good as running for, for bone mass. So walk, calcium, vitamin D. Good deal. Sounds good. Doctors, thank you very much. That is our show for today. Coming up next, uh, next time we're going to talk about why depression in men doesn't always mean having the blues. And we'll also have some tips on keeping your pets healthy. Why, when they're happy, you'll be happy too. I'm John Hess. And I'm Karen Owak. Thank you for joining us and don't forget to visit the healthreporter.tv for your daily dose of information in the world of health. Keep in touch and tweet us at 4HealthTV. Our thanks to our doctors Mark Lawler and Neil Okamura. So long for now and we'll see you next time.